Hey guys, it's Kay Jones coming at you with another video. This is my Raids 1 Chambers of Zera guide. It's focused primarily for Ironman, however, main accounts can use it too. I officially hit over 600 Raids 1 KC not too long ago, and I thought it's time to make a guide. Short disclaimer uh, this video is for beginners and for people who have never done raids before and just want to get their feet wet and try out their first raid and go ahead and get some completions. So I'm not going to have a lot of specifics like melee skipping or mage skipping. I'm going to leave that out of this video because it's already going to be long enough as is. Hope you guys enjoy. Alright guys, now I'm going to go into the stat requirements. I highly recommend 90 plus attack, strength, and defense, 90 plus range and mage, and 78 herb lore is a requirement for Iron Man. A trident is also a requirement, and 87 slayer plus will obviously be needed if you're an Iron Man. I highly recommend a warhammer or a BGS for a spec we weapon. It's extremely important in raids. Lastly, I would like to say you probably could learn raids 85 plus attack, strength, and defense. Same with range and mage. However, I really don't recommend that just to get the levels, guys. For my clan, personally, you must have 90 plus stats and 78 herb lore. That goes for mains and ironmen. Alright guys, so I'm going to start getting into raids gear. This is the setup that I will be using throughout this entire guide, just so you're aware with it. This is an advanced setup and not for beginners. I will be showing you two gear setups that's going to be void and non-void, and I think it's great for beginners. Alright guys, so this is my void gear setup. Please ignore my Vernic Defender. I don't have a Dragon Defender, so my bad. Just pretend as if that was a Dragon Defender. As you can see, I've got my blowpipe, all that good stuff, anti-poison, mage and rain switch, a crossbow, and a strength potion. That strength potion will be important for a boulder shortcut, which I will explain later on. If you don't have 99 strength, it's definitely good to bring a strength potion for some extra points. If you can make super combats as an Iron Man, that's an even better choice overall. This is my non-void setup. I actually think that this gives you more points than void in my personal opinion. And I like this setup overall better because when you upgrade your gear, all you gotta do is change the gear. You already have like, you're used to the non-void setup if that makes sense. Also, I forgot to mention, you do not have to bring a ring of suffering. I'm just a weird defense nerd and I bring it everywhere with me, but a lot of people wouldn't recommend that. But yeah, this is my non-void setup. As you can see in that below bottom corner, I have water spells, which is air, mind, and water to uh, water strike, which will be very helpful at ohm. You don't have to bring them. However, if you don't bring them, make sure somebody else on your team has waters. Now I'm gonna go over how to scout for raids one. Okay guys, so before I really get into how to scout and everything like that, the first thing I want you to do is go ahead and download Ruinlight. You don't have to use a third party client, but in this specific raid guide, I'm only gonna be showing you how to scout with Ruinlight. I don't feel like it's worth the time to go back to the old days and explain everything in the, in the wheel cog and all of that. Um, make sure you download it from the correct website, which is ruinlight.net. Be very careful to not download any untrustworthy links. So in order to set up everything so you can start scouting for raids, you're going to want to go to this little configuration cog right here. Type in Chambers of Zarek. Make sure it is enabled. On this edit plugin configuration, you can do options like displaying the elapsed raid time, uh, display the points in the chat box, um, the most important that I find is to show the scout overlay and to show the scout overlaid inside raid. These are the most helpful. So go ahead and make sure you've got your third part party client set up and you have this all enabled. It will really help you out with scouting and raiding. All right, guys, as for scouting, basically you're going to go to the dashboard and hit make a party, which you'll be seeing right here. I click make party. Well, sometimes it glitches, but there you go make party and you go in the raid and basically you look for really good bosses like Mutadile, Mystics, Tightrope, the easy ones and you try to avoid Vispula, Vanguards and everything like that and maybe even Vasa if you're new. So that's the best way you can scout and the great thing is that Ruin Light makes it easy. It just shows in that upper left hand corner which is great. 
Now I'm gonna go over RAID shortcuts. All right guys, so the first type of shortcut you can get is a tree, which you have to chop down, as you can see that I'm doing here. All shortcuts, by the way, are in rooms with scavengers. These shortcuts can give you anywhere from 500 to 1,500 points. All right, so the next puzzle is a boulder. It's best to all push the boulder at the same time, and that's why my team will use the smite option. It allows the other players to know, hey, we're all gonna push the boulder now. If you don't all push the boulder at the same time, other team members will miss out on points and you will be the only one who gets points. It's not a really nice thing to do. Another thing, that boulder is where the strength pot comes in handy because the when you push that boulder, it takes the average strength level of all of your team to push it. So if everyone's 99 strength and you're not, you won't be able to push the boulder. However, you can always boost with your strength pot to be 99 strength. The last shortcut that I'm gonna show you is the mining rock. And basically it takes the average of everyone's mining level in the raid and that is what level that is required to mine the rock. The same goes for the tree for wood cutting level and the same goes for the boulder which is for strength level. Alright guys so now I'm going to show you the four puzzle rooms that you can get in any raid but it's always going to be the same four. So the first room is the crab room and it's really freaking difficult to explain. Basically you're trying to bounce off beams of light off the crabs to knock out or diffuse the colors of the crystals here let me show you if you range a crab it will turn the crab green a green light clears a purple crystal now let me show you this in action if you look closely you can see that green light diffusing that crystal now that same concept applies with the other crystals if you melee a crab, it turns red and it will clear a blue crystal. And that will look like this. Basically, you just need to be very careful where the crabs line up. A white light will clear a black crystal. In order to get a white light, do not attack the crystal. And that will look like this. And lastly, a blue light, which you can get from attacking the crab with mage, will knock out or clear a yellow crystal. Bada bing and bada boom. Really, it's just important where your crabs are placed. The next puzzle room is tightrope. And it's weird because it's not really a puzzle room. It's very combat oriented. Basically, somebody's going to have the tank, pray mage, kill the majors. And then the next one will be the rangers. And you're going to have to protect range when you kill the rangers. Basically, whoever's tanking is going to be taking the most damage. You're going to want to range both of these guys. So there you go. Protect range. These rangers hit like a truck, so be very careful. Tightrope is amazing points, and many people like to have this in their scout. The person who ever scouted the raid usually goes over the tightrope, which requires a certain agility level based on the average of everybody in your raid, and they get the crystal. This crystal will, I think, give you about 500 to 600 points when you use it on the barrier. So go ahead and be that good person. Whoever scouted, let them get the crystal. The next puzzle room is thieving. Basically, go ahead and drop your potions or put your items in your, the chest that is made and start searching these caskets. You're going to be getting grubs, and these are the things that you need to get past this room. Every once in a while, you'll find something like bats, like you see my character get right there. Bats are great because they'll give you extra points when you eat them to restore your health. So I think you also find some extra points for finding them. But yeah, once you get these grubs, basically you're gonna go drop them off in the trough up north or near that scavenger over there. As you can see, he's ate enough, he's gonna fall asleep. So that's it. In this room, basically just get grubs and put them in the trough and you're good. For this last puzzle room, it is called Ice Demon, and this is what you gotta do. You gotta cut wood. So go ahead and get yourself a tinder box. You can pick up an axe in a tinder box at the beginning of the room there. I always bring an axe with me though. Uh, you can go ahead and drop your potions or store everything in the chest. It's completely up to you. But you need some inventory space for some kindling. And you're gonna light this kindling as the torches. 
Once you're lighting the kindling at the torches, ice demon will slowly unfreeze. And when that is happening, make sure that you turn on your range prey. So go ahead and get your Warhammer specs off. In this room, you can actually safe spot where you won't get thrown ice balls at you. But for the sake of this video, I'm not going to describe that. Just make sure you dodge the ice balls. What you can do is you can get two hits in and then move. And you should be just fine. Ice Demon's pretty chill. Something I highly recommend is you can bring Fire Wave or anything like that and a Tome of Fire. And you'll hit up to 50 damage using Fire Spells, Tome of Fire, etc. It's really good. Alright guys, so the first boss I'm going to go over is my favorite boss in Raids 1. It is Mutadile. Basically, you pray range. And that's it. My suggestion with this boss is to back the F up before you get smacked the F up. Mutadile is my favorite. There's a small Mutadile and there's a big Mutadile. Basically, you can get chomped in one hit and also you can get stomped on. I'm going to show you here what not to do. As you can see, I'm standing right next to Mutadile. I'm protecting melee, so I'm not really getting hurt. Look at, look at the balls on this chick. But this is what you don't want to do. You want to stay your distance. I got kind of lucky here, but if you get close like this, go ahead and protect melee. So after the small Mutadile is down, you're going to want to go in this corner over here. Most of the time when you're raiding, there will be players that tell you where to go, so just follow them. Continue protecting range. Here's another example of what not to do when Mutadile gets too close. Mutadile can not only chomp you, but also stomp you. <laughs> I'm spamming brew. I think it's important to show the perspective of what could go wrong at Mutadile because it is a very easy boss. Basically, just back up and don't be in front of his mouth or close enough for him to stomp on you. Now, what I do have to say is there's specific room for Mutadile where you can safe spot him. Go ahead and ask your raid clan members, hey, where's the safe spot and what room is that? And I just tank that like a boss. But that's it, guys. Pray, range, and attack Mutadile. Sometimes Mutadile can be really tough in anything that's below three people. So in duos, it's a very tough boss. And in solos, it's a completely different boss, which I'm not even going to go into that. Okay guys, this next boss room is Mystics. It's a very common boss room because it's very easy. More experienced players will know how to safe spot these Mystics correctly, but it's very simple. Pray Mage, and I highly recommend that you bring a Salve Amulet uh, EI because it gives 25% more damage or accuracy. I'm not very sure. It's just really good against undead things. So go ahead and bring your Salve EI. I personally don't bring it. I bring Anguish because Salve is only like plus or minus three worse than Anguish. I'm not very sure. It's just preference, but you should bring it. Players, you'll learn over time as you do this room, all the safe spot methods and how you can basically melee them and they won't attack you, etc, etc. But for the sake of this, Blowpipe does excellent damage when you have below six people and Basically, if you have over six people, go ahead and use Ruby Bolt so you can get those procs. It's really good. Uh, my ex advice with this is to go ahead to listen to the experienced players and to follow where they are and attack the mystics while praying mage. Okay, guys, so the next uh, boss I want to show y'all is Guardians. It's highly recommended for beginners and everyone loves Guardians. Make sure that your pickaxe is on smash, use super combat up, and put piety on. So you can see those guys, how they're going in tick. They go two spaces back, wait, and then hit. You know when to hit whenever the, the guardian sword is lifted and raised. That means he's back in position and you know it's safe to go ahead and attack him. Basically, you need to understand the ticks. So it's about two ticks before you can attack again after you've already attacked him. Try to stay in pace with your partner. Because if you don't, falling rocks will fall from the ceiling and players will take a lot of damage, especially in large raids. Okay guys, the next boss I'm going to go over is shamans. Every time you have a raid with shamans, make sure you have your anti-poison. It's very important. You can also bring a sand few serum. It's up to you. Shamans are difficult in groups where you have more than five people. It starts to get a little hectic and I don't recommend doing them over that amount of people. 
The most dangerous thing about these guys is their poison blobs. You can't differentiate between the normal range attacks and the blob attacks. You're going to want to default prey range during this, but you're going to want to constantly be on your feet, and crossbow is the best weapon for this. Blowpipe, you're a little bit too close for comfort, and you'll take more damage, especially when you're learning. Shamans will jump unless you're on the corners of the walls, so if you stay near the wall, they're less likely to jump, if not jump at all. You can save spot shamans, but I would wait to do that with more experienced players who can set it up correctly. Uh, my suggestion is every single time you see a shaman do an attack, go ahead and move. Probably move anywhere, probably from three to five space tiles. That way you'll never get hit. It's a very simple room, and shamans is a very common boss that people like to do. However, I would switch out tecton for shamans when you have groups over five people. Alright guys, this next boss is Tecton. Make sure that you're protecting melee and only do this boss if everyone has Warhammers or BGS spec. The only time you could probably get away with somebody not having spec is perhaps more than 4-5 to five people. But this boss is, has a very high defense and is very reliant on the Warhammer and BGS specs. If you have a BGS, make sure you spec after all Warhammer specs have hit. It is recommended to hit your special attacks whenever Tecton is on his orange phase. When he's on his red phase, try not to, try to avoid using specials. So somebody is gonna lure the boss. Be extremely careful when you lure him because you can trigger him to go back to his anvil. So make sure you kind of get the hang of that. Perhaps put a more experienced player to, to go ahead and lure him. The best thing I can recommend for people at Tecton for Beginners is do not stand in front of his shield or sword. You kind of want to stand behind him. Another recommendation people say is to go counterclockwise continuously. You'll get the feel of Tecton the more you do him. But as of now, stand away from his sword and from his shield. Um, eventually, Tecton is going to go back to his anvil. And when he does, there's going to start to be sparks flying around everywhere. You want to try to avoid those sparks and the way you're going to want to do that is to separate from your other players in the room and every time sparks are thrown make sure to run two tiles away that way you won't get hit eventually tecton will get off his anvil and you can get back on him and go ahead and kill him and finish him off this boss can be glitchy and go continuously back to his anvil however jagex has supposedly tried to fix tecton all right guys, now I'm gonna go over some of the harder bosses that I recommend for more experienced raiders, and that is Vasa, Vanguards, and Vespula. I don't recommend this for beginners, however, this is gonna be a complete raids one guide, so I thought might as well add these bosses. All right guys, so the first boss I'm gonna go over is Vasa. A lot of people like to do this boss because it gives a really good amount of points. However, I don't recommend your team do Vasa unless they're pretty advanced and have some really good stab weapons, such as Hosto or Abyssal Dagger, etc. So one player is gonna run in, preferably somebody with low, lower health, so everyone takes less damage. You're gonna be praying Mage. Once Vasa has done its first attack, switch to range and start attacking the boss with range. Vasa's slowly going to move towards the crystal. Get ready to switch to your melee gear and your stab weapon and stab down that crystal. You want to get as much DPS as possible on that crystal because Vasa heals at the crystal. After that crystal is down, go ahead and get back on the boss with your range weapons. That's basically what you do for Vasa is you range it down and every time it goes to a crystal, you switch to your melee gear and kill the crystal. After the third crystal, which is not in this video, everyone will get teleported. You're going to want to switch to Mage Prey and run towards the middle. After the Mage attack is done, switch back to range and get back on the boss. However, a big deal about Vasa is you want to stay at lower health because the person who gets teleported, if they have very high health, everyone else is going to take a lot more damage. But if they have, let's say, around 50 health, people are going to take less damage and people are a lot less likely to get one hit death whenever that teleport occurs. Unfortunately, in this clip that I got, we killed Vasa so fast that I don't even think it did a teleport phase. Usually that teleport phase happens after the third crystal. My apologies about that, guys. All right, guys, the next boss I'm going to go over is Vanguards, but before we get into that, I'd like to go over the Combat Triangle because it's very important for this boss. 
So always remember that range is weak to melee, and melee is weak to mage, and mage is weak to range. I know that's really confusing saying that out loud, but check out this combat triangle. You can kind of see in the picture and what everything's strong to and what everything is weak to. That goes the same for vanguards. All right, guys, so the first vanguard I'm going to go over is the meleeer. You're going to want to protect melee and attack this vanguard with mage. All right, the next vanguard I'm going to go over is the major. You're going to want to protect mage and attack this vanguard with range. Finally, for the ranger vanguard, it looks like this, and you're going to want to protect range and attack this vanguard with melee. As you can see, each vanguard looks very unique. All right, guys, so let me show you how vanguards work. We got a little bit of humor here. I was going to get my group to go into vanguards, and everybody decided to pussy out, and it was just me running on in there, aggroing them. And I'm like, yo, where is everybody? And they just booked it and left. So I'm in there with three freaking vanguards on me, and everyone's sitting over there in the corner. And I'm running back, and I get everyone maged. Ha, that's what they get. But anyway, let's continue a little humor for the day. We all decided to go in, and the big thing about vanguards is making sure that you keep them within 30% health of your team members. That's why it's so crucial to either be on Discord or to have just some professional people who can really look at the health bars and know. Because if you go past 30% on one vanguard, the other vanguards heal. So each team member needs to make sure when they're attacking the vanguard, they need to stay within 30% health. As you can see, we're moving around the room with the vanguards. You can stay in one spot and switch your gear, but I find that harder. So pick a dedicated vanguard that you want to attack. Something about the melee that I would like to point out, the melee tends to roam. So, you know, we even have two majors on this thing, and it's roaming to the other side of the room to attack somebody else who is ranging the major. So check this out. He's just like, I'm going to attack this other dude. But yeah, so I kind of suggest bringing barrages for the melee because he just likes to not stay in his spot <laughs> jagex please fix that because that's just ridiculous anyway guys make sure that you stay with between 30 percent health bar with the rest of your teammates all right guys now the next boss is vespula make sure your team members are very much so away from the room because if you trigger vespula it will spawn early and the grubs will immediately start taking damage and you don't want that to happen because then they turn into bugs and you'll just be taking too much damage that you'll be able to handle so as you can see we're using the redemption method couple important things I want to note. This is an advanced boss, and even I'm not a professional at it, but it's something you will need to learn for challenge raids whenever you want to start getting to that, or solos. So here what we're doing is we are tanking a hit when we hit the portal, and we immediately run back to that safe spot tile. So tank a hit, and we immediately run back to the safe spot a tile, our redemption will trigger. The max hit Vespula can hit is an 8. So if you're above 8 HP, you will, when you hit the portal, your redemption will heal you. You'll go back to zero prayer points. You'll have to take a sip of prayer point, uh, prayer pot, excuse me, and repeat. Put back on your redemption, hit, and rinse and repeat. There may be a situation where one of the grubs become to, you know, they get low health. This is when a team member will have to run to one of the like the little bushes or whatever and pick three flowers and then they're going to run over and feed the grub. You're going to see one of the team members coming from the bottom corner over there. He's taking three flowers from the side and he's going to feed the grub. That may happen if you're not killing Vasa quick enough using this method. Oftentimes the problem is people run out of prayer. The best way to do the redemption method, especially in solos, if, if, is if you have a prayer in hands. Because every time you hit, whenever you come out of that safe spot, you go back to zero prayer whenever your redemption kicks in. Well, if you have a prayer in hands, it automatically restores your prayer every tick. So it's great, and you don't waste any pr uh, prayer potions or restores. I hope this makes sense, guys. It's very difficult to explain Vespula, especially since I haven't gotten enough practice. But I hope this helped. All right, now I'm going to go into the preparation for Ulm. The first thing you're going to want to do is get secondaries. And in order to get secondaries, you're going to find scavengers. Scavengers are in rooms with only scavengers, and you're going to kill them. Get about 30 in darkened juice. 
15-ish stinkhorn mushrooms, and 5 sicily. As you get better, you'll need less of these secondaries. These items are what's going to help you make the potions for preparation for Ulm. These are the potions that you're going to be creating to help you at home. You're not going to need any of the potions that you brought in. You're going to make your own because these are more enhanced and powerful. So basically, you're going to make Xeric Aids, which is an improved version of Brews. They're a lot stronger. A Revitalization is an improved uh, Restore Potion. A Prayer Enhance is basically it restores your prayer over time. And an Overload, which improves all your stats including range and mage melee etc it's similar to nightmare zone if you've been there before if you haven't basically it restores your stats combative stats over time and it boosts them so it's a really strong potion all right so i'm going to go over how to make xeric aids these are going to be your brews you're going to want to use a, a water vial just like herb lore with an endarkened juice and a buchu plant. You can get the bushu plant by planting them with seeds and harvesting them with farming. You're going to make revitalizations or also known as your restores by using a stinkhorn mushrooms with bushu on a water vial and those will make your restores. You're only going to need one prayer enhance for Ulm but basically you're going to use sicily and bushu on a water vial to make one prayer enhance. Next is the overload which you're going to need for Ulm. You only need one of these, and you're going to need three Golpar, one Noxifer, one Sicily, one Stinkhorn Mushroom, and one in Dark and Juice. You're going to use three Golpars on an empty water vial, and you're going to make one Elder Potion, which is red, one Kodai Potion, which is blue, one Twisted Potion, which is green. And then you're going to use a Noxifer on one of those potions, and then it will create an overload. All right, so let's talk about what you all have been waiting for, the Great Ohm. I will show you video clips of all of Ohm's attacks. Don't worry, I just like to go over some important things first. There are four phases. The first and second phase are the same in which you kill the mage and melee hand at any rate that you wish. The third phase, you must kill the melee and mage hand at the same time. If you don't, it will start over the phase. The last phase, you're basically going to be ranging Ulm and dodging falling crystals. Throughout all four phases, Ulm will switch between a range and a mage attack. However, he's not consistent, so he may stay on mage for a while and then switch to range. You just have to change your prayers accordingly. You will save a lot of damage knowing the difference between mage and range attacks. Up top, you can see that the big old blobs are the mage attacks and bottom you can see little solid crystals being thrown those are the range attacks study those closely and make sure you can differentiate the difference between the two and pray accordingly after each phase there will be falling crystals dodge them each phase will either have acid attacks burning attacks or crystal attacks at the beginning of each phase you can look down in your chat box and it will say ohm is feeling the power of the acid or the power of the burning, or power of the crystal. That lets you know that, hey, these attacks are coming. Let me go ahead and show you what some of these attacks from each phase look like. First, I'm gonna go over the flame phase. So one of his attacks that he can do is he can burn you. As you can see here, he's throwing a burn at my character. This is very deadly because if you stand next to any other players, it will spread the burn. So try not to stand near any other players. You want to make sure there's always a tile between you and another player. So here are three players at the melee hand. As you can see, since it's burn phase, we all have a space in between us. That means if one person gets burned, like you're going to see here, the middle person is about to get burned. The other two players do not get burned because there's a space in between us. However, when another player moves near another player, it causes another player to get burned, as you can see here. Therefore, keep your distance when you're burning. The second type of burning attack that Ohm can do during flame phase is flame wall. If you get stuck in that flame wall, make sure someone has water runes to let you out. All they have to do if they have the runes in their inventory is click on the fire and you click outside of it to get out. If you get stuck in that fire or flame wall, you will take, I think, up to 60 damage. So make sure your friends let you out. Or, you can always let yourself out as well. Now I'm going to go over the special attack that's used during crystal phase. 
Basically, Ohm's going to throw this attack at you like you see on my uh, player, and you're just going to need to go ahead and walk it out. Just walk it out. Just walk it out. Or when you get professional and you have a lot of raids done, you can try to off-tick those falling crystals while you attack the mage or melee hand. During a crystal phase, Ohm will also throw crystal bombs out into the middle of the raid. Do not stand on one or next to one or you will take lots of damage. Now I'll go over the attacks in acid phase. One of the attacks is Ohm will just throw out random acid, so make sure you don't stand in it. The most annoying attack that Ohm will do on acid phase is that he will spit acid at you and you have to walk it off. Make sure that you just walk it off away from everyone else. This is how I feel about those acid drops. Hey Kelsey, I have a present for you. <laughs> I'm gonna come to middle finger. Now that I've got through the unique phase attacks of acid burning and crystal phases, now I'm gonna go over the consistent attacks that happen in every single phase. The consistent attacks that you will see throughout every phase is crystals, lightning, and pairing, and they consecutively continue in this order every time. So after crystals, there's gonna be lightning, and after lightning, there's gonna be pairing, and after pairing, there's gonna be crystals, and it's gonna keep rotating like that throughout the entire ohm. Here's an example of the crystal attack. The crystals show up on the floor, and you need to dodge them accordingly, otherwise you'll take up to 40 damage. This is an example of lightning that comes after crystals. Make sure you're not in its way, because if you get stuck in lightning, it will freeze your character and it will also momentarily turn off your prayer. Lastly, here's an example of pairing. Basically, you're going to be paired with another player and you're going to have the same colors matched up at the bottom of your feet. It's not always white, but make sure you run to that other character and you're standing right on top of them. If you're farther apart, you'll take more damage. If you're square next to them, you'll take 5 damage, 2 squares, 10 damage, etc, etc. I'd also like to add another consistent attack that Ohm does throughout all the phases. He will throw orbs at you that drain your prayer. There's a mage orb, a melee orb, and a range orb. Melee is red, mage is purple, and range is, is uh, green. As you can see here, my character is being attacked by a mage orb. Make sure to check, check your chat box to see which orb is being thrown at you and so you won't get confused with other players. The final thing I'm going to go over is roles. There's usually going to be someone on melee, mage, and someone running the head in the middle. The reason why someone's going to be running side to side in the middle is to, to allow Ohm's head to move from side to side so he's not just attacking one side of the raid. First, I'm going to go over the mage role. Basically, at the beginning of each phase, you're still going to hit your Warhammer specs off on the melee hand and then you're going to go over to the mage hand as you can see here and you're going to attack the mage hand. It's important that you stay as close to the wall as possible so you allow the head to turn. When you're paired with somebody on, when you're on the mage roll, if the person is running in the middle who you are paired with, you meet them in the middle. If you're paired with somebody on melee hand, you meet with them at the melee thumb. Once again, I'd like to reiterate, when you're on the mage hand, you need to make sure you're standing basically anywhere to the left of that tile marked. Here, I'll draw it out for you. Now I'm going to go over the melee hand, which is a little bit more complicated. So as you can see, I'm going to stay to the right of that tile marked, similar to the mage hand, but however, I'm meleeing. The trick is, is that Ohm cripples his hand and the hand will also heal on the third phase. Let me show you some examples of this. Alright, so here's going to be an example when the melee hand cripples like this. When this happens, you can't just sit there and do no DPS. What you're going to do is you're going to switch to your mage gear while the hand is crippled and you're going to long range on your trident. The reason why you want to long range is because you want to stay in that tile location that I mentioned a couple times. This still allows the head to move side to side for the runners and you're still in your spot. However, you're, put, you're putting in DPS, not just standing there and doing nothing. You have to wait until the hand uncripples again. So the melee hand will heal randomly on the third phase of Ohm. This is the same phase where you have to kill the hands at the same time. If you look closely, as I'm attacking, 
the, the melee hand starts to have an infinity symbol go over the hand. That means that the hand is in healing phase and you're going to want to go ahead and switch to your mage gear and long range on the trident and wait for the infinity sign to go away. Alright guys, now I'm going to go over the running roll. So if you do this perfectly, you shouldn't really take you damage. You shouldn't even have to use your prayer. It's actually a great roll. You're going to be maging the entire time until, of course, the mage hand dies. But as you can see here, I'm moving two tiles every time Ohm's head moves in one direction, I move two tiles the other direction. Okay? And then I run to the other side when he moves his head to the other direction. And that's it. You're just running two tiles the opposite of direction of what Ohm's head is looking. As you can see, you miss all those mage and range attacks. Now, it's important when you're running um, in the middle that you pair with the correct person. In this case, since I'm in the middle, the major will run to me and pair with me. However, if I was paired with somebody doing the melee hand, I would meet them at the melee thumb. All right, guys, that's my raids one guide for Chambers of Zarek. I hope you guys liked this guide and it helped y'all out. It took a very long time to make. I think it took a little bit over a week to make with a lot of hours involved. So if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to my channel for future videos or of course progression videos and IRL videos. Thanks for watching guys and I hope y'all have a great one.